Um, it's been an honor for me to be in dialogue with some of the faculty at ICS and some of the programs, and so I'm, I'm actually intimidated and honored to be chosen to say a few words about the book that you all should buy, um, and hopefully there are enough copies. So that's all I really have to say is <laughs> buy the book. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I'm really glad to be, to be asked to celebrate Ron's book and offer a, f a few words. And the problem with a few words after a book like this is that the book entices you to go back to read Rorty again. So I did, and I've had to shorten my remarks. So I think that alone is testimony to the book's evocative, um, stimulating power. And, and I think the author, I'll just say a few words about Ron. Um, for a few years since coming to Toronto uh, to teach at Emmanuel College, I've enjoyed getting to know Ron both as a friend and colleague, and have really come to appreciate the open, an inquisitive spirit by which he approaches philosophical and religious questions. Um, beer with Ron is always a coveted thing. We'll even do coffee on occasion. Um, so I, I appreciate the more balanced and thoughtful way he engages in conversations with such a wide range of topics and thinkers, from reformed epistemology to critical theory to pragmatism, from Paul Ricoeur to Charles Taylor, and now Richard Rorty. So for me, it's this open and balanced quality of thinking that brings Rorty home to heart in Ron's new book and makes reading it so enjoyable. So having overprepared, I'm going to draw it together and just share a few snapshots of the book that highlight this open um, and balanced quality. And I'll hope to do so in a way that indicates a sense for Rorty as an important figure still on the horizons of both philosophical and, I would want to include, theological discourse. He's somebody that should be reckoned with. In fact, Ron states earlier in the book um, that his initial reaction to Rorty as a student was an allergic one. I had the same reaction for different reasons, but Ron states it mainly because of what he took to be Rorty's seemingly uncritical affirmation of American political liberalism. And I must admit, too, upon rereading some of his books, like Achieving Our Country, uh, I'm, I'm a little worried, too, about some of the claims he makes. But Ron credits his teacher, Henrik Hart, in the book for teaching him that, quote, one can almost always count on Rorty's thought to be richer and more complex than it first appears, unquote. And this is a good start, for Rorty's known for his throwaway quips like, quote, truth is what your peers will let you get away with saying, end quote, or religion is the great conversation stopper. Uh, in an essay responding to Stephen Carter's book. He's criticized also for being evasive and blowing smoke to avoid taking positions, um, for dissolving problems instead of answering them responsibly, and for just being all around snide. <laughs> Rorty's views, it seems, get attacked from all quarters, the left and the right alike. But Ron invites us to consider things more carefully and seeks in his book, rather than trying to cover all of Rorty's enormous and wide-ranging work to, quote, help the reader develop a sympathetic ear for what Rorty was trying to do, end quote. And it's obvious in this book that Rorty is doing things worth paying attention to. So in the book, uh, and I'll just sort of give some snapshots here, Ron takes a risky strategy that I think pays off. In the beginning of the book, he introduces us to Richard Rorty's story, his biographical details. Drawing heavily from Rorty's own deeply personal and autobiographical sketch, Trotsky and the Wild Orchids, and also from sociologist Neil Gross's book on Rorty's intellectual formation, the first chapter helps the reader see that Rorty's writings are indeed reflective of personal circumstances growing up with social activist parents, the daughter of Walter Rosenbach. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> um, and also, as the chapter's title suggests, pursuing what Ron says, an existential quest, uh, that he gradually, that is, Rorty, jettisons in its own, own original metaphysical inclinations towards a pragmatic position. In fact, and I didn't know this either, Rorty wrote with Charles Hart Hartshorn at the University of Chicago on process uh, philosophy, doing his thesis on Whitehead's notion of uh, potentiality. I, th I think that's an interesting theme that emerges in Rorty's later work, too, without the process metaphysics. But early Sorty, or, or excuse me, early Rorty sought to unite the private and public, the personal and, and social, in an overarching metaphysical vision. 
Later, he came to disassociate himself from this and choose the path of what he called a liberal ironist, one who holds the truth not as referential objectivity, but as intersubjective solidarity in the shape of democratic conversation, who in fact prizes freedom over truth as creative and innovative self-made possibilities for living, all of which are fallible, temporary, and provisional stopping points in an ongoing process towards a future unyet, or not yet specified. So as I finish the book, given this, my sense deepened that Rorty's project in its various permutations might in fact be animated by what he calls later social hope, formed in the early crucible of his home and carved out step by step throughout his academic career into his later, later writings. For example, I think it's no accident that Rorty's thoroughgoing and anti-authoritarian, uh, and I would say iconoclastic, vision of pragmatism seems to be to no small degree about opening up space for solidarity and freedom and novelty. Chapter two then builds on this and Ron tries to articulate Rorty's philosophical method as a therapeutic one. Beginning with his monumental philosophy in the mirror of nature, Rorty attacks the ahistorical foundationalism of traditional philosophy and enlightenment philosophy for seeing truth and rationality as representational immediacy as direct mirrors of the way things actually are. And instead, Rorty seeks to promote uh, a nominalist and historicist picture of philosophy as, quote, edifying. Trained not on obtaining objective validity, but rather on resisting closure and keeping the conversation going among a variety of interpretations. So in place of the quest for certainty, Ron uh, explores, there is now a search for solidarity the best example of which is the open-ended and give-and-take process that distinguishes truly Socratic philosophy. For in the end, there is no correspondence between word and reality that is itself not already the finite product of conventional usages and habits that are themselves caught up in linguistic and social webs of relation. He spells this out further in Consequences of Pragmatism, and I found a key quote that basically illustrates this. He, Rorty says, there's nothing deep down inside us except we ourselves have put there. No criterion that we've not created in the course of creating a practice. No standard of rationality that's not an appeal to such a criterion. No rigorous argumenta argumentation that is not obedience to our own conventions, end quote. So Rory the therapist then um, suggests that truth might be better cast in the pragmatic terms of solidarity, in shared habits, of making communal agreements, not in the realist sense of objectivity, where something is appealed to that happens outside or regardless of conversation. And solidarity is not achieved by being grounded in something more essential or objective, a common human nature or a transcendent reality. Developing these themes further, chapter three highlights the cultural politics that arise out of this kind of scheme the liberal ironist, Rorty. In his book, Contingency and Irony and Solidarity, Rorty emphasizes the utter contingency of human language, selfhood, and community, but in a way that leads him now to the positive vision of a public liberal utopia composed of private ironists. I think I'm getting it right. <laughs> you can correct me after this. Uh, noting that all human beings carry about a set of words which they employ to justify their actions, their beliefs, and their lives. Rorty calls these a final vocabulary and goes on to describe the ironist and one, as one who has radical and continuing doubts about the final vocabulary she currently uses because she's been impressed by other such vocabularies and who realizes that arguments phrased in her present vocabulary can neither underwrite nor dissolve these doubts and who does not think that her vocabulary is closer to reality than others, that, is, that it is in touch with a power not of her own making. So Rorty goes to say that final vocabularies are necessary vehicles for making sense of and coping with and functioning in the world. They inform our deepest convictions, ourselves and our culture. But here's the rub, and Ron draws this out nicely. They're final in that there is no non-circular recourse to anything beyond them. They're as far as one can go with language. 
And it's the recognition of this radical historicity and contingency, the unnecessariness of such discourse, that makes the ironist different from what Rorty calls metaphysicians, those who seek to ensure validity for their vocan final vocabulary by connecting it to a skyhook or some single permanent reality to be found behind the many temporary appearances. And furthermore, in this, the ironist is self-creative. Why? Because the criterion for resolving doubts about one's final vocabulary is freedom. An ironist is one who tries to get out from under inherited contingencies and make her his own contingencies. Get out from what Rorty calls the old final vocabulary and fashion one that will be all his or her own. Redescribing the past in new terms, one becomes willing to say, thus I willed it, in fact, Rorty says. And we accomplish this, this engagement, by enlarging our acquaintances, in Rorty's words, imaginatively engaging other vocabularies and playing these off each other in a conversation, redescribing ourselves in light of other vocabularies in an ongoing conversation. So Rorty sees final vocabularies as more poetic achievements than metaphysical, of metaphysical substance. Rather than the fruits of having discovered reality, they're more the results of our own self-reflexivity. Uh, in fact, the poet is visionary, a cultural hero who is able to redescribe their own final vocabulary and imagine new kinds of self-descriptions and empowering new vistas of human possibility. But how does this lead to a vision of public and liberal utopia? As I learned from Ron here, the strong thesis, it seems, in Rorty is that the crucial freedom gained in the ironic recognition of contingency is that freedom itself conjures a certain kind of society, a liberal one, where the freedom of proliferating possibilities is opened up and cruelty to one another is viewed as the worst thing we might do to each other in the process. So as Ron puts it, self-creation is tempered by solidarity as an achievement. As solidarity recognizes shared human susceptibility to pain and humiliation, and which itself, these, and which these things impinge upon freedom and novelty. So Rorty's private ironists and their vo final vocabularies is a public liberal who is at base anti-authoritarian, but whose social hope lies in the ad hoc solidarity forged not by something objectively defined once and for all, but by a conversational solidarity of all. In this light, I think the chapter ends with a very helpful illustration of what would Rorty do Ron asks the question, so how do we apply this? And Ron uses the Occupy Wall Street movement as an example of how Rorty might deal with the circumstance. And I don't want to spoil it, so read what he says. Only, okay, I'll say this. <laughs> Rorty's anti-authoritarian bent interestingly ends up being pragmatically reformist and not so leftist radical in the end about piecemeal reform. So as I read it, solidarity wins out over radical freedom. But that's a tension in Rory that perhaps we can talk about later. What I think is really helpful about the book uh, is that building on earlier discussions, the fourth and fifth chapter bring a crescendo out of the discussion to play out two often underexplored dimensions in Rory's work. One, his vocation as what Ron calls, drawing somewhat from Rory and from Jeffrey Stout, the anti-clerical prophet. And two, in the last chapter, Rorty's own openness to radically rethinking his own position in conversation. So Rorty actually lives into his ideal of hard argument and changing if necessary. Ron helpfully points out that Rorty's atheism, for example, in chapter four, is not of the camp of the new atheists like Dawkins, what I like to call the know better camp. We know better than you. Theists. Um, in fact, because this, ca this camp of atheists who claim to know better appeal precisely to their kind of referential epistemology that Rory's already undermined. Now, this gets them into trouble with some who want to raise up scientific method as the apotheosis of all things rational. But it does kind of render mute the atheism that claims to know better, to have all the evidence in store against theism. 
Rorthy's other kind of atheism, if you call it that, is what, uh, what might be called the no worse camp. These are my words, and, and so blame me for the confusion that they introduced, not Ron. But the other camp of atheism is that you're against theism, not because you know better, but because you know the pol- negative political effects of religious discourses and the way that they preempt democratic conversation. By appealing to an external power, Rorty says ecclesiastical institutions are dangerous because they stop the conversation from flowing needed for solidarity to emerge. In fact, they're neither liberal nor ironic. So Rorty's anti-clericism emerges as a cultural politics and not an epistemological or metaphysical position. Again, he's kind of sneaky on this. <laughs> um, and we can talk about it in the end whether there aren't metaphysical assumptions being imported here. But it takes the form here of what Jeffrey Stout calls prophetic persona, resisting the authoritarian bondage that diminishes human responsibility and self-reliance and also blocks the conversational openness to invention and novelty that Rory holds as so important. Religion is dangerous. And so uh, Rorty, as an anti-clerical prophet, fits his philosophical therapeutic, his uh, diatribe at times against religion, fits his discourse on uh, resisting traditional epistemologies and, and also his democratic discourse as a liberal ironist. Religion for Rorty seems to mean conservatism, closure, and eventual dehumanization. What I like about Ron's book is over and over again, rather than outrightly criticizing Rorty, he gently pushes where Rorty might go farther in his claims. And so Ron introduces a couple of thinkers to take the reader through some of the commentaries and criticisms of Rorty on these grounds and nudge possible positions. I won't spend time detailing the material, but just want to tease you by saying this chapter on religion made the book entirely Uh, worth reading and surprised me and it got me opening all kinds of other issues. And he uses, um, and I won't detail them in length, Simon Critchley, who brings Emmanuel Levinas into conversation with Rorty. Rorty denies this, but then Ron introduces a couple of thinkers to say, well, wait a second, Rorty actually shows some sympathy with thinkers like Vatimo and Levinas about the kind of transcendence required of the ethical claims Rorty wants to make which places them close to people like Levinas. Jeffrey Stout and Nicholas Waltersdorf are other conversation partners that push Rorty even further, questioning Rorty's notion of private as something unshared, as if the public were a space of sharing unanimity. This restricts, according to Stout and Waltersdorf, conversation. It restricts the freedom of some voices that actually Rorty wants to uphold, those who are religious in character. So while Rorty's notion of conversation requires permission for various unshared perspective to be voiced, his judgment that religion is a conversation stopper should be omitted seems rather unpragmatic and artificial in the end. Rorty responds to this by agreeing he should not have said this, that religion is a conversational stopper, but rather that citizens and democracies should avoid conversation stoppers as much as possible. So he kind of takes religion out of there, but says, and as if to whisper, and religion is that. (laughs) Uh, But even here, appealing to religious authority, there need not be a preemptive uh, move against conversation, for it's possible, and Rorty admits as much, to give theological reasons that account for a particular social political agenda, and to do so in a spirit of ongoing debate and discussion. Rorty's fear, however, and it continually comes back, as Ron points out, is that religious claims in the end uh, amount to public bullying, and so thinks of his liberal utopia as pretty much a purely secular one. Yet Rory showed his capacity to change his mind on cherished principles, such as his dismissal of truth as objectivity. And in Chapter 5, Ron details how Rory, in an exchange with Bjorn Romberg, admits to a kind of objectivity as necessary for the very edifying conversation that he holds up as essential to solidarity. But I want to circle back to the theme of religion in the end and wonder if Rorty's position couldn't, in fact, be brought around to appreciate religious voices 
as partly constitutive of the public democratic conversation. In fact, I wonder further whether his exalted view of the American democratic experiment and its utopian hope doesn't in the end function as a kind of quasi-religious authority that, infirm, uh, that informs his position, in fact, taking the place of God almost as a redescription, tantamount to poetic transcendence, if nothing else. So in concluding, I just want to say um, I hope this shows the appreciative sense I have for the book and how it got me thinking. And I want to conclude by, one, saying go buy it again, and two, asking two questions, and maybe it could be a conversation. Um, first, Ron, do you think Rorty's position could be open to acknowledge the potential benefit of religion and public discourse more robustly as a contributor to actually imagining public solidarity? Would, would he go there like he changed with Romberg if, if pushed? He died sooner than, than uh, I wish in that. And if so, if he would change his mind, how do you think he would in your experience? How, how do you think he might be open to possibilities? You use the example of Levinas, and you use the example of Waltersdorf and um, uh, Stout's criticism. But I wonder if that could be taken further. My second question is, and this is my own uh, thing, and it, and it hinges on some conversations we've had about the role of tradition and community. Does Rorty need a thicker account of tradition in his way of speaking about social hope? And I guess I'm thinking of Jeffrey Stout's book. Does, does, he, does his anti-authoritarian strand keep him from granting the important place of communities and actually forming our imagination? And, and forming our bending towards a future and hope. I get the sense when I read Rorty that traditions are seen as impediments. In fact, I quoted him to kind of make the point that we're supposed to always redescribe ourselves in new poetic renderings that move beyond who we are. And so I wonder if traditions can be seen as more than impediments to solidarity and conversation, but actually um, formative for the social hope that he holds out there. And I find it ironic, in fact, that he ends up quoting Whitman and Dewey and the pragmatists as his tradition, in a way, but kind of slams every other tradition. So maybe I'm caricaturing. So let me have it, if, if so. But um, I'll just conclude that I think social hope is an openness to an unspecified and freer horizon of solidarity. But the conditions for it arise amidst already operative traditions of solidarity. And I wonder if there couldn't be a more balanced thing in the end. Um, but I've gone on way too much, and I appreciate the chance to be here by the book. It's a marvelous testimony to Ron's uh, insight on these things. So thank you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs>